lectures uh, given by Tomas Prosen on the dual unitaries and uh, chaos. As you probably noticed on the program, there's no lectures in the afternoon. Somehow we shortened the program for one lecture because uh, Romain Vasser canceled due to illness, so you can go and swim. <laughs> But before that, yeah, we look forward to, to the last part given by uh, Tomasz. Okay, so sorry to hear I'm the last one standing between you and uh, vacations. But <laughs> okay, good morning everyone. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll continue where I stopped yesterday. So I still owe you uh, some explanation of the magic that happens one, when one requires the <coughs> Uh, conditions of dual unitarity. So rem I remind you, just to remind your, uh, yourself, I mean, we are working now with these operator gates, which I denote as W, which are uh, folded uh, gates uh, for states, right? So you could think of like one on top of the other, but this one is upside down. The first one is upside down, so this is, uh, again, you transpose uh, tensor U dagger, <coughs> and the one, so this one is U transpose, and the one behind is U dagger. Okay, so now once you translate our conditions of unitarity and dual unitarity to these W gates, this we had four very elegant constraints. I will just uh, write them on this part of the board because we will now be needing them. I don't, sh should not use too much space. <coughs> So which means two bullets. So this I will sometimes call a bullet. When you press two bullets from the bottom, they just go through. When you press two bullets from the top, they again just go through. Uh, so this will be condition one, condition two, and then there condition three. You do this from the sides as well. Condition four, you do it from the other side. Okay, so now let's see what happens. Now, if you try to contract some correlation function, let's do as an exercise. I mean, you'll see how it goes immediately, but let's do like three by two circuit. This. As I explained to you yesterday, each correlation, two-point correlation, can be reduced to a partition sum of a rectangular lattice. Right? In this case, it's lattice like this rectangle. So uh, the initial operator, so now let's assume that the initial operator is here, and final operator may be here. They're not, they are not exactly on the same side. They are displaced a little bit. And everywhere else, because we have initial condition, which is uh, uh, completely mixed state, right? We put it press bullets. Completely mixed state means trace. I mean, it means uh, just, yeah, uh, contracting all wires from the bottom. So we get bullets everywhere else, right? So now what happens? Um, I don't know if you allow me to do this. Uh, it will be faster if I just use my hand, right? But of course, for you, it will be a mess. But sorry for that. So now, <coughs> what I will do now, I will try to uh, contract this. How I contract, I use this rule. Bullets here, <coughs> I contract this guy, I can, I can use this rule, bullet here. <coughs> I can do this from the other side. You see, I already now got detachment of the, of the, of the diagram, so diagram is kind of trivial, there is no correlations. As soon as I have two disjoint uh, uh, tensor networks, there could be no correlations. But if we go even further, now we can detach this guy. So then we get this and this. Uh, whenever you have this guy, this is one, right? Because I normalize this with one over square root of d, otherwise it would be d. So this is one, I forget about it. Then this one, I can contract this side or this side, doesn't matter, like this. Again, I do like this, and I do like this, and I get this. So at the end of the day, I get trace of a times trace of b divided by square root of d, square root of d, which is equal to zero, right? <coughs> So now you can ask when, what remains. Well, what remains is the only thing that remains, and uh, of course that's easy to show uh, formally, uh, but I'm not going to be very picky. The only thing that remains are two types of correlators. In particular, 
uh, only non-zero correlators are uh, these guys. When the two bull the two field bullets, that is the observables, are along the light ray, so which means that the time, so if this is x, so this is observable A, but this is position x. This is observable B, but this is position y. So that is time. So when y minus x is equal to t, <coughs> and then these guys, of course, get contracted like this. So that is uh, C of uh, <coughs> of of uh, y, which is y, which is x plus t, comma x t. And uh, moreover, if you remember how I defined my my lattices, I mean this would be odd lattice number, right? So because my lattice was always defined that I started with the gate one two, right? So this would be odd. There is a staggering. There is naturally staggering in this problem, so we have to discriminate between odd and even sides. <coughs> if we place an observable on the odd side, then it will go right. Excitation will go right. If we would place it on the even side, like here, as you will see, the excitation could only go left. So in this case, it goes right. So this is what I will refer to as, well, uh, sometimes we put it like a C plus, like a, uh, I mean, because correlations really split into two contributions, the left mover and the left, left left and the right correlation. This is the, the, the right correlation. Uh, I will write it as m plus to power t. Uh, OK, here it's still ba. As you will see, uh, no, maybe, maybe I'll wait a, a second with this definition, but um, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, let me at the moment just define it as c plus ba of Okay, because it only depends on t, right? It doesn't depend on x, it only depends on the fact that x is odd, and then it only depends on how many steps I do. Now t really counts number of half steps, so the full Floki period is two steps, but here it's one, two, three, four. It's four steps, two Floki periods. Now this is one of the two, the other is when I place the observable on the odd, on the even side, like here, then the only way I can get not killed uh, is if I contract in this way and then place the last observable here on this edge. When, whatever else I do, for example, if I would place this last observable here, I could use my rule whatever uh, three. I could do this way and I would immediately detach the circuit and this would be trace B, trace B is zero. So the only way to get something non-zero is to put observable in this diagonal. OK. <laughs> so now then, I will call this, uh, now this x is uh, even. And then there is a y. This is observable a. This is observable b. I will call this, uh, this is cba. <clears throat> uh, now here, y minus x is minus t. So now y is x minus t, comma x. Uh, t, and this I will call C minus B A of T. <clears throat> okay, so now I will, uh, now you already see what's going on, right? I mean, the dynamics, I mean, and all the other correlations are zero. So if I, now I, I can write a compact expression for the correlation function of arbitrary pair of local observables. Ought, this will be one, right? Uh, now, <coughs> there is delta y um, minus xt, and then c plus. What's c plus? B a of t plus one half. 1 plus minus 1 of x, delta y minus x minus t, c minus 
AFT. <coughs> so, I mean, uh, even before anything else, I mean, we already got something quite remarkable for some dynamics which is not integrable. It is, fi it is fine tuned, but it's some rather still, uh, as you will see later, quite generic class of dynamics. We have been able to compute explicitly, I mean, express explicitly the two point function, which is a hard, looks like a hard uh, object to compute. We evaluated it in terms of something that is essentially 1D. So, I mean, <coughs> now already the structure of this tensor network suggests that this could be computed as like a 1D transfer matrix, right? It's like a partition sum of a 1D vertex model. So I will now define what I will call a transfer matrix, or as you will see, it's just a quantum channel, which will be this map, which I will just iterate, right? <coughs> and uh, <coughs> uh, so I will define a quantum channel. <coughs> Sure, I'm consistent with my notation. <coughs> okay, but before doing that, I wanted to do one more explanation. So, how do I intuitively explain this result? So now, as you will see, um, we, we kind of shown that correlations can only spread along light rays. So even though there is a Lee Robinson theorem which says that correlations should spread within the light cone. We have now found that they cannot be actually non-trivially within light cone, within light cone, but they can be only on the light edge, right? So, uh, so how do I intuitively explain that? Well, uh, the point is now I have a strange system which has two types of causalities. It has spatial causality and temporal causality, because I, I told you locality plus unitarity give me causality, <clears throat> and now I have unitarity plus locality in both directions, in space and time. So I can claim I have. Uh, like this is t, this is x. I had on one, on one hand, I have a statement that due to spatial, temporal unitarity and locality, correlations can only move within, within this light cone. But because I have, uh, so this is temporal unitarity. But I have, a, since I have a spatial unitarity, correlations can only move so correlation between this two point and any other, this point, or the origin and any other point of space time can only be non-zero within this light ray. So the intersection of these two guys is, is just this, which means y minus x is plus minus t. So correlations can only move with the speed of light. <coughs> or whatever is maximum speed in the, your, our, our, our model. Okay, uh, <coughs> so now, let me now to be more precise, let me now define um, the object in which I will evaluate these uh, two pieces of correlation function, C plus and C minus. I already sketched their tensor network diagrams. I just have to now take one step, see how it goes, so I take, uh, uh, I'll define what I would call a quantum channel. I mean, this is the, 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 the terminology from uh, quantum information theory. Basically, you could think of this as an evolution on a density matrix, even though our observer is not density matrix. I mean, or if you want, this is like a dual evolution to a quantum channel, so you could think of an observable, but never mind, it doesn't really matter. The structure is essentially the same. So, uh, so you could think of, uh, let me just sketch now one thing. I mean, this is like uh, M plus, M plus will be, I will define M plus as as this black box, right? There will be input and there will be output. So let me now try to be precise, M plus operates in an operator. And now, and it spits out this. So this is the object M plus of an operator, right? <coughs> um, this is the transpose and this is U dagger. And if I now write it in terms of formula, uh, what is this? This is just uh, taking operator tensor product identity. 
then you multiply from the from the make sure I be correct, then you multiply from the right by u, so that's why I write u transpose because it's multiplication from the right, but from the left I multiply it by u dagger, and then I take, uh, at the end I take a trace with respect to the first space, partial trace, right? You all know, I guess, what partial trace means, right? So I take a partial trace and I get an object which is supported on a second Hilbert space. I mean, it's an operator uh, which acts on the second on one copy, let's say on each one, on, on a one qubit state a space. So, and this is exactly what people in quantum info would call a time spring representation of a, of a quantum channel, right? <coughs> it's a particular type of quantum channel. It's a unital quantum channel because it maps identity to identity because I put unit density matrix here. Uh, I forgot one thing. I think I forgot one over D because of normalization because this has to be a density matrix, right? So it has to be one over D. But then this is an honest proper uh, parameterization of a quantum channel. <clears throat> it's a particular type of quantum channel because U has du to be dual unitary, so it's not just any quantum channel, but anyway, it has all the features that quantum channels can have. In particular, uh, I mean, it's sometimes it, in some other community it would be called a quantum Markov chain, so it's a quant what some people would call it a quantum stochastic operator or quantum stochastic matrix. I mean, if you think of it as a matrix which acts uh, on a vectorized operator, it's a stochastic matrix. But it has a little bit more structure, so it could think of it as a quantum stochastic matrix, but it has, again, satisfies the conditions of perion frobenius theorem. So its spectrum is in the unit disk, and there is always an eigenvalue one, which is associated in this case to a unit operator, right? So it is, uh, that is unitality, means that also lambda zero is equal to one. The corresponding eigenvector V0 is equal to one. I mean, it's the unit, unit vector. I mean, please, I mean, uh, this is a bit, uh, I don't know, going to a slightly different field, so is there any, if, if there is anything needed to be explained and I didn't explain, please ask. I mean, uh, I assume that most of you have seen uh, something around this. Uh, if not, I can probably say something more. Um, now, for the completeness, then I define also the other channel, M minus, M minus, is the other diagram which goes right, uh, left. <coughs> and M minus on A is one over D. I just flip one and two, so here I make a trace over the second space, U dagger and one tensor A. Okay, now I have to pause a little bit and explain what we've achieved. I mean, I think for some people this uh, kind of, this finding was quite remarkable because, you know, some people, I mean, I mean at least, uh, there, is, there was some quest, you know, to find uh, many body dynamics which, which, which is its own perfect Markovian reservoir. And this is, this is it. I mean, you usually, you know, Again, now I return to several of the lectures of this school. I mean, people are discussing thermalization, which is a very important phenomenon in many body physics. And there we want, I mean, we want to explain thermalization. Basically, what we are saying is that a uh, local uh, state of a system is like a uh, Gibbs state, right? It becomes like a Gibbs state. So why, why is this? Because the rest of the system acts on it as a perfect reservoir, right? And this is, I mean, ne there can be nothing better than this where the rest of the system acts as a perfect Markovian reservoir. So the reduced dynamics is a Markovian dynamics. Yeah. Is, is a non, this is, this is the Markovian dynamics of paraxonals. I mean, it cannot be better than that, right? It's a single qubit. You could think, okay, if it doesn't work for a single qubit, I mean, maybe you could say, okay, it works for sufficiently large subsystem, yeah, but uh, so that the correlation length is smaller than the length of the subsystem, then you can maybe argue in the same way for genetic dynamics, but this is, specific dynamics for which it works even for a single qubit. <clears throat> okay, so again, I mean, I try to advocate, I mean, this is useful if you want to have, a, you know, an example of a system which is a perfect reservoir for, I mean, for, for itself. So, I mean, you can test your, some of your ideas on this model, maybe much easier than on generic models. Yeah, I mean, 
uh, well, that's, I don't know if I would call this a reason, but yeah, that's of course consistent with that. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, this transfer matrix, the fact that this transfer matrix is stochastic matrix, I mean, that's kind of necessity, I think, I mean, uh, for, for the consistency of everything, right? Because, uh, I mean, I guess you could formulate everything in terms of some sort of, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure if I can make a more clear uh, statement, but. Well, uh, it's the lack of, uh, it's a kind of uh, lack of correlations, I would say. I mean, that it correlations this somehow, as you see, I mean, again, there, is n there are correlations which survive, of course. I mean, but uh, they only could survive in one direction. Uh, <clears throat> again, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know if I make, can make a very, I mean, oh, I mean, it should not be seen as un, something unexpected, but it should be somehow taken as surprisingly good. I mean, that it, it, can, it can work so good. I mean, one would not be, should not be surprised that something like that can happen. So you have a unitary many body dynamics, and the dynamics on a subsystem is Markovian. Well, it's usually not the case, but it's stochastic. I mean, it's, it is a, is a the fact that the dynamics on the local subsystem is a, is a, is a quantum uh, uh, it's a quantum map like CP completely positive space preserving map that should be obvious right but that, that map is Markovian uh, uh, so that it can be written in terms of iteration of a of a, of a simple Krauss, if you want, I mean, this can be written in terms of Krauss representation, for example. I mean, this is like a you know, simple, you know, people have discussed, some, some people discussed Limbladian in this school. I mean, this is like a discrete time version of Limbladian dynamics, right? So it's really uh, <clears throat> as simple as it can get. I don't know if I can give you a more intuitive picture. I mean, one should just get too used to it. I mean, it's like, I'm more like, uh, yeah, <clears throat> anyway, so. <laughs> okay. Uh, any other question? Relation between the two? Uh, yes and no. Uh, they both contain the same U, but they have slightly different aspects. So, for example, I will now discuss uh, the spectra, I mean, the spectral decomposition of the two guys and see what we can say about correlation functions. And in principle, these are two independent spectra. So you can have, for example, well, uh, let me continue and then you will see it, right? <clears throat> Any other question? Okay, so, uh, <clears throat> right. Um, so now we are basically, aha, uh -huh, now, now I basically touched the, 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 the point uh, of, uh, no, before going there. Uh, I would now, okay, so before going there, I would now maybe characterize uh, these dual unitary gates for qubits. So now the question is, so there are two things I want to do. Uh, second, I will try to discuss then the, the general uh, 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 spectral uh, uh, classification of spectral features of these of this quantum channels. But uh, before going there, maybe I will discuss first the uh, uh, representation for qubits, full parameterization for qubits. of dual unitary gates or qubits, which means d equal to 2. <clears throat> um, as I already mentioned yesterday, I mean, the general <coughs> question of how to characterize these dual unitaries is a hard question. But for, for qubits, uh, we can say a lot. I mean, we can say everything. We can basically characterize completely uh, this manifold, this set of unitaries. Uh, so before going there, I would like to make a little uh, detour, and I would like to put, pose a little exercise. Show the following. 
I mean, I, I decided on purpose not to show it myself, even though it's like a two-line uh, calculation, but uh, it would be useful to use it as exercise, and then you think during the break. So if u is dual unitary, then, sorry, yeah, if du u is dual unitary, if and only if, if and only if, <coughs> composition of u and the swap is uh, unitary after partial transpose. So for example, do a partial transpose irrespective of uh, each subspace. I don't know, for those who don't know these terms, maybe I will not explain them even because it's not so crucial for our, but most of you I guess are familiar with these uh, notions like partial transpose, right? So if I take, uh, if I compose U with a swap uh, and uh, do a partial transpose, then uh, this can be unitary or not. And if this remains to be unitary, it's, uh, these gates are sometimes called T-dual, right? So gates U times P are called T-dual if they have unitary uh, partial transpose. And it turns out that uh, uh, T-duality is equivalent to dual unitarity after uh, multiplication with a swap. Okay, that's a uh, simple, uh, simple uh, thing to, to show. Uh, then another claim. Uh, dual unitarity is preserved under multiplication with uh, single qubit uh, gates. single qubit gates. So, th there is a simple proof. Now, let's suppose that uh, this guy is dual unitary. Then I claim this guy, where I put, where I decorate this gate with a single qubit arbitrary quadruple of single qubit gates is still dual unitary. That's the most general thing I can do, right? So if this is u, let's call this u1, u2, v1, v2. So then this is u1 tensor u2 on u, ten, v1 tensor v2. So what I claim is that if this guy is dual unitary, this guy is dual unitary as well. <coughs> how to see that? Well, it should be obvious. Well, how do we know it's obvious? Well. Unitarity is obvious, right? We should only have to show dual unitarity, but um, <clears throat> you may remember when we showed dual unitarity, it was something like that. Now I'll do it in terms of gates, um, in terms of state gates. So now this is u, u dagger, uh, uh, u1, V1, uh, sorry, sorry, this is uh, there. So this is U1, U2, <coughs> V1, V2. This is V1 dagger, V2 dagger, because we have to transpose. And this is U1 dagger, U2, so little u, dagger, little, little U1 dagger. Now, now what we have to do for dual unitarity, we have to contract this guy, the wire, and this wire, right? But then you see the here it's V and V dagger against each other, so they annihilate. Here it's U1 and U1 dagger, it's annihilating because it's unitary, right? So it's like nothing were there, right? So then dual unitarity means I can erase this guy, but then this guy collides against its Hermitian dual, Hermitian joint, it's canceling, and this guy is colliding with itself, it's canceling, okay? So dual unitarity is kind of uh, symmetric. I mean, when you decorate your gate with arbitrary single qubit unitaries, uh, dual unitary survives just as unitarity. I mean. And then again, it's another reason why we like to paint these wires under 45 degree angles. Because it just says that it goes this way, so it goes, and then its orientation is important, right? <coughs> so then you have to decide on your direction of, 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 of time or direction of evolution of the movie, right? And then the arrow should go, you know, along the movie direction, 
then it's the gate. If it goes against, it's the gate Hermitian joint, right? It has to be time reversed, right? That's why it's good to have this 45 degree because then uh, you can always decide whether you have to use U or U dagger. So it's again, I mean, it's like Dirac notation, right? I mean, you have, when you have consistency in your diagrammatics, then everything can be, again, done automatically, right? Okay. <laughs> okay, now, once we have this, then it's very easy to classify uh, dual unitaries. So we start with a general representation of U4. There is this statement, again, I will not quote the original source because I don't know it, but there is at least two or three papers in the last 20 years which reported this and will use this. Um, <clears throat> so it's well known in the quantum information community how to parameterize arbitrary U4 matrix in U4. So four-dimensional unitary complex matrix can be parameterized as <coughs> U now is a phase. Then there is uh, two gates which are uh, on the left, two, two, two single qubit gates, V1, two. Then there is um, what people call Heisenberg gate. And then there is U1 cross U2, <coughs> where these guys are arbitrary SU2 matrices. So arbitrary two by two matrices with diagonal one. V1, V2, U1, U2 are arbitrary SU2s. <coughs> so this you can parameterize each of them with three parameters as you like, maybe Euler angles or uh, whatever the unit vector and the angle. Um, so the, each one, one of them has three parameters. It's, in this business, it's usually nice to kind of do the, 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 the dimension counting, right? So how many independent parameters you have to specify a, a given manifold. So now it's one, two, three, four uh, SU2s, which means three plus three plus three plus three is three times four, 12 parameters. Then it's one, two, three, it's 15, plus one is 16, and 16 is equal to four squared. And this is what mathematicians tell you that it should be the dimension of the unitary group, right? Uh, uh, if it's dimension four, it's four square, right? So it, it, well, it's fine, it's fine. Now, the, what we have to figure out is how constrained is now the, the condition of dual unitarity on this structure, on this parameterization. Now we can easily forget about this guy because we have just shown that we can always undo single qubit rotations. So we only have to worry about these Heisenberg parameters, right? And that's a trivial calculation. Again, I give you as an exercise. Uh, to figure out that if you want to respect dual unitarity, two out of these three guys have to, have to be equal to pi over four. And since I can choose arbitrary cyclic, since I can do cyclic permutation of the Cartesian axis by appropriate choice of single qubit rotations, that is a global rotation if you want, can be written as a product of single qubit rotations, I can always choose that these two guys will be x and y. I mean the components which I will fix to pi over four will be x and y. So the gate is dual unitary. With U is dual unitary if and only if Jx, Jy is equal to pi over four. So I have what again mathematicians would call a, a manifold of codimension two in U4. So I can I have constrained just by fixing two parameters, right? So now you can say. Now it's up to your taste. I mean, whether you find this very constrained or not so very constrained, right? I have 16 dimensional manifold, I have to fix two out of 16 parameters, and I arrive to something which is much more fancy in a sense. I mean, at least it allows me to do much more. <coughs> so not so, not so terrible, right? <coughs> okay, then there is another parameterization which is sometimes used. Now we can ask ourselves, um, yeah, that's for qubits, but I have uh, spin one system or spin seven over two system, so can I do something? Can, I pro can you propose me uh, an interesting set of dual unitaries with, then, with, with that? The answer is yes. I mean, this inspires actually uh, general, more general parameterizations, which are not complete, by the way. I mean, this is the only one which we know which is complete. So complete means that any dual unitary in this Hilbert space can be written this way. 
what I will say next will be just a subset, will be just an interesting subset. Okay, so, uh, so now the first statement is that, uh, again, a claim. Now I'll make a couple of claims which I will not prove because we have a limited amount of time and uh, uh, it's Friday. But uh, since weekend is long, maybe you can try to prove all these claims or try to clarify them for you. Uh, sure. No, uh, it will be all SU2 representations, as you will see. I mean, at least the examples I will make. Uh, of course, uh, you can try to to go to spin n representation for n level systems. Yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I mean to go to SUN, let's say, rather than SU2. But <clears throat> no, I will just remain within SU2. So higher higher spin representations of SU2. What happened? Uh, okay. <clears throat> So now the next claim is uh, that this Heisenberg gate with two parameters, well, one thing which I remind you is that uh, if I take all the three parameters equal to pi over four, then this is just a permutation gate. Now I'm not sure whether there is some phase factor in front of it or not. Uh, I never remember that, so I will just put it like this. But that's just a permutation. That's just a swap. <clears throat> I think it's just a swap. Maybe there is an I or something sticking out. Maybe I should subtract some I times identity here and then it's an I sticking out, but it doesn't really matter, so I will just put it like this, or proportional to permutation. <clears throat> okay, um, so that means that I can take this gate So that means that this, whatever, whatever is left here, whatever phase is left here, I can absorb it to the global phase here, so it doesn't matter. <coughs> now, I will take, uh, I mean, then now I say, okay, my par only parameter which survives now is Jz. So I have Jz plus 13 plus a phase plus 12 parameters here, so 14 free parameters. <coughs> So what I will do now, I will say, okay, now this is just a swap times uh, a ZZ gate. That's a diagonal gate. That's very nice, right? So it's a swap times a diagonal matrix in Pauli, in the canonical representation, right? In computational basis, if you want. Now this J is related to JZ, I think it's just pi over four, of, one is pi over four. Of, uh, so I mean, you can take pi over four out, so JZ is J plus pi over four. <coughs> I mean, these three guys, these three, three, three operators commute, so I can just take this guy out and, and have this. <clears throat> okay, so now it means that I have a canonical representation, canonical representation of dual unitaries, TU of global phase, V1, V2, into the IJ and now <coughs> it turns out that this parameter J is probably the, the most important one right if if J was zero this gate does not entangle because it's just a swap essentially it's a swap times local qubits local qubit operations, but they cannot entangle, right? And swap is just exchanges. Right, so if you have product state, it maps product states to product states. Uh, so basically it turns out that people who study, again, quantum info on these uh, circuits, I mean, they already knew about these kind of gates, and they knew that this J is just what they call entangling power. So J or something, some function of J, I mean, the sine J square or something, uh, is just entangling power of this gate. So the larger, the, the <coughs> The J is equal to pi over four is the most entangling gate. Most entangling. 
So that's good to know. So now when we will see some transitions from regularity to chaos, these transitions will be mainly or easily, most easily observed when we will change parameter j. So if you need some good examples, take this gate, change j. j is the best parameter. And this, this v1, v2, and u1, u2 should be there because they have to break integrability. Because without those guys, this gate is integrable. Remember, this belongs to a class of gates I discussed in example yesterday, which are integrable. Beta ansatz that's integrable, right? This is x, x, z. This is basically just a special degenerate case of x, x, z model. So I have to scramble this with some local fields. These are like local fields, right? Single qubit unitaries are local magnetic fields. And if they're all different, then this will surely break integrability, so we have some generic non-integrable dynamics, which has some entangling power. And that's, <coughs> let's say, could be a nice, uh, yeah, an example of chaotic many-body quantum dynamics, as, as you will see. <coughs> okay, so now, that's, that was it. So now I will, now we are ready, basically, to discuss some, yeah, some ergodic theory <coughs> on example of dual unitaries. So this is really, I mean, very satisfactory because now we can go to a textbook. We can open the textbook of Arnold uh, from 40 years ago, 50 years ago, and uh, he explains to us very clearly what mathematicians mean by ergodicity. Uh, he says even more, I mean, he says that, okay, there is ergodicity, but there is also mixing, but there is weak, weak mixing. I mean, there are different aspects of thermalization, if you want, in mathematics, stronger or weaker. Ergodicity is just the weakest one. And then there is mixing, which means that correlation functions decay and so on. So I will illustrate this on this example. I mean, so for those of you who have never seen that, <coughs> it's also useful because it might ring some bells and uh, stimulate you to do some further reading parameter systems theory. <coughs> okay. <coughs> Ergodic hierarchy. Of dual unitaries. No. Uh, so now let's uh, take back our channels, m plus and minus. Uh, remember, our correlation functions were like, uh, oh, I should have left the formula, which, which gives me the correlation function, or maybe I'll just quickly rewrite it because I will have to rewrite it in terms of A and B. Okay, so now you have these two channels, M plus and minus, and they completely specified uh, the decay of correlation. So now, what I will do now is I will diagonalize. Um, I will leave this page still empty. I will continue here. So the first step is diagonalize M plus and M minus. So M plus and M minus are linear operators, so they can be written in terms of matrices, right? M plus and M minus are D square by D square matrices, right? They act on vectorized uh, single site operators. They are D square of them. One of them is unit operator, and you can take all the others to be traceless. So it's good to use some sort of canonical operators basis, like uh, Pauli basis or in general, Gelman, generalized Gelman basis. So taking unit operator and the rest traceless, so Hilbert Schmidt orthogonal to unit operator. Uh, well, no matter what basis you use, I will not go into that detail here, but you can write uh, uh, you can write left and right eigenvectors of, of these guys, so um, uh, uh, um, it's 
called uj lambda plus minus comma j. So now we'll use two indices for the eigenvectors. The first index will be which channel, plus or minus, and the second will be the, the, the number, which will go from zero to d squared minus one. So zero will always refer to a unit operator and to eigenvalue one. And now, you, uh, aside from the right eigenvectors, you have also left eigenvectors, which you can write like this. I will call them V. So let's also put plus minus here, J plus minus J V. It's the same, eigen sorry, here it's U plus minus J, right? <coughs> sorry, down C V. Right, so now we can write a spectral decomposition of M plus M minus, which is sum over U, um, U plus minus J, lambda plus minus J, cross V plus minus J, okay? And I, I will, I mean, I have to choose this left and right eigenvector such that they are, uh, that they are, I mean, these are operators, right? So they have to be Hilbert-Schmidt orthogonal, right? Orthonormal. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so now I can take arbitrary power of this. Now here, I mean, of course, you could now scream, right, that this is not the most general spectral decomposition, and indeed it's not. I assume now that the eigenvalues are non-degenerate, and if they were degenerate, there could be some non-trivial Jordan structure, which I have now neglected, but never mind. I mean, I don't want to get now too messy, but yeah, if you want, you can include that. point is now once you have diagonalized the problem, then it's easy to find uh, iterations, right? And then um, uh, the correlation function, which you want to, to compute, right, would be like trace of B M plus minus to power T of A. And what would that be? Um, now, uh, I have to be a little bit careful because now this is vectorized, right? Uh, but now it's again, uh, so basically it's something like trace sum over j lambda plus minus j to power t, and here it is trace b times u plus minus j times trace of uh, a times v plus minus j. Okay, so there are, two, there are some scalars, right? There are some scalars which depend on the eigenvectors of the channel and on the observables a and b. Uh, but the point is, this is the crucial part, which is the exponential decay, right? So basically what you get is that uh, the only thing, I mean, the, the key thing to worry about is now what is, how does the spectrum of this M plus and minus look? There's always an eigenvalue. There's always an eigenvalue one, which corresponds to uh, unit operator, right, which we took out somewhere. <clears throat> There's always this guy. The question is, where's the rest, right? This guy is irrelevant because eigenvalue one does not contribute because these guys are traceless, because one of these guys uh, is unit operator, and this will give us this term to vanish. So there is no worries about this uh, isolated eigenvalue one, but there could be other eigenvalues one, or there could be other eigenvalues on a unit circle, or there could be all eigenvalues within unit circle. So that's the key of uh, classification of ergodic error here, right? Now, once you have an access to to, to dynamics like this, then you can immediately say what, what can at worst happen with correlation functions. So then we have, I will have four different uh, levels of ergodicity or non-ergodicity depending on the structure of the spectrum of these quantum channels. So the worst or the most non-ergodic situation is non-interacting dynamics. So dynamics can be even non-interacting. And this means that all 
to d squared minus 1. So there is d squared minus 1 non-trivial eigenvalues for each of the channels. 1 is always trivial, right? This one. So d squared minus 1 for each, so 2 times d squared minus 1 are non-trivial, but it could happen for some miraculous reason that all of them are equal to 1. So all 2d squared minus 1 non-trivial eigenvalues are equal to 1. <clears throat> this means that correlation functions stay constant. Nothing can happen. This means that correlation function CDA by XD is constant. <clears throat> I will try to plot a picture for each case. So picture means all eigenvalues are here. try to do like this so that you see that there are many. So this is the, the spectrum and the correlation function. <clears throat> so of course, this is totally boring, but we have such an example already on the previous board. This would happen if, if j was equal to 0. If j is equal to 0, this is just swaps. Uh, well, we need more. We need j equal to 0, but we need also that this u and v uh, sorry, this u and v are trivial, because if this u and v would not be trivial, they could produce some phases. This will be the next case I will discuss. So really, uh, this means just a swap circuit. As a swap circuit, we could think of uh, as a, I mean, paradigm of free dynamics, right? <coughs> Example, swap circuit. <coughs> okay. Uh, yeah, so I used my board here to go to the... Second case, non-ergodic uh, and interacting. Uh, so there could be uh, there could be some uh, eigenvalues which remain one. There are n, are n larger or equal to 1, but less than two dis less than all non-trivial eigenvalues equal to 1. <coughs> so that means that there are terms here in this spectral sum, a spectral decomposition, where was it? Here. Uh, keep this formula under your sight. So when there are few terms here which are 1, which have non-zero coefficient here. This means that there is a term in correlation function which doesn't want to decay, which means that correlation function will do something like this, and then it will decay. <coughs> then it will uh, freeze. Yeah? It will freeze to what some people would call a Druda weight, right? So uh, non-zero time average of the correlation function. <coughs> so for that, we have the following situation. We have here a bunch of eigenvalues at one, but then the rest of the spectrum is inside unit disk, as it should be for generic interacting dynamics. <coughs> okay, now let's just put three next to it. <coughs> so now next is ergodic, but not mixing. means that there are eigenvalues which are not at 1. There are non-trivial eigenvalues which are not at 1. So again, always when I say this, I mean j different from 0, of course. So there are uh, there are eigenvalues. So for all, all non-trivial eigenvalues, all non-trivial eigenvalues, are different from one, 
but but there exists an eigenvalue which is which modulus is equal to one, <coughs> right? Which means that uh, there will be just one eigenvalue here, but then it could be eigenvalues like here. Now again, the nature of the problem is such that the, the characteristic polynomial of stochastic matrix is a, is a real polynomial, so its spectrum has to have conjugate pairs. So if there is eigenvalue here, there has to be one uh, across the real line. Um, <clears throat> so there could be at least one pair of eigenvalues which are on the unit circle, and then the, co the, the problem cannot be, uh, cannot be uh, 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 mixing, but it can be ergodic. It will be ergodic if this eigenvalue will, have, will not be irrationally related to pi, which means that it will not return to one with, uh, after finitely many, after finitely many steps. <coughs> um, so this will, if, if it's like pi over three, then it returns to one after six steps, right? Uh, it returns to two pi after three steps. So. Say again. Exactly, I said that already there, but I stress it again. I always, non, when I say non-trivial eigenvalue, I mean j different from zero. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, then you would have what some people would call a time crystal. You would have what some people like, uh, in the lectures of Norman Yao, this would be called time crystal because that would be exactly uh, sub subharmonic response, right? Now you would have, I, uh, now what I have here is what some people would call a time quasi crystal, right? Because the evolution is uh, aperiodic, but it's, 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 it's you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's quasi periodic. I mean, so that's exactly what the mathematicians call quasi periodic. So uh, this means that correlation function will never, de will never die. <coughs> Now this, this is just giving you the uh, frequency of oscillation of the correlation function because this is the phase. I mean, this is e to the i phi if you want. And this e to the i phi happens here to be e to the i phi t, right? So this phi is just the frequency with which this, I mean, t for us is, 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 uh, is discrete, so it's, you can think of snapshots of the harmonic function uh, stroboscopically sliced. No, no, five over 11 is irrational, right? Yeah. Suppose I have square root of five minus one over two, which is golden mean. Right. Then I have quasi-periodic, yeah. So no, any rational, of course, will, will return after some denominator, right? Of uh, if phi would be two pi over k over L, then after L steps, steps, I will have, you know, lambda to L equal to one. <coughs> No, I mean, I will, I will discuss in the last lecture, I will discuss chaos, what I believe is the, the, the best definition of chaos, which has to do with random matrix theory. So far, I'm not using the word chaos at all. I mean, I'm just trying, I mean, so if I say chaotic, I mean, it's just like to, as a teaser, right? I mean, I can only discuss a notion of ergodicity and mixing, right? The way that uh, Arnold taught us, or mathematicians taught us, right? So it's... Uh, <clears throat> There's, not, there's not nothing uh, really related to chaos yet. Yeah. Well, they cannot because it's a, uh, it's, a, it's a Markov chain, it's a stochastic matrix, and there is, you can easily show that uh, the spectrum is bounded to unit disk. This would be a complete, I mean, this would be instability, right? Actually, this could happen for bosonic systems. I mean, if you would write, let's say, Lindblad equation for bosonic systems with some strange drive, this could happen, right? Um, but for systems with finite dimensional Hibbert space, this can never happen. So. <clears throat> Tomás, can you maybe, this non-mixing, can you define it? I'm not yeah, sure yeah. You uh, I will define, you will, it's very really clear when I will define mixing at the end, right? Okay. And you, 
I, I, then you could do the reverse, right? You would go back and see what, why I call this mixing, which is the best possible, or the most generic, but also the, the, the best possible situation, which is mixing. Ergodic and mixing. If I was a mathematician, I would call it just mixing because for mathematicians it's obvious that mixing implies ergodicity. But since physicists prefer the, the word ergodicity, I say, okay, ergodic and mixing. <clears throat> okay, so that, that situation where all non-trivial eigenvalues are within unit disk. Are strictly less than one. That means that <clears throat> Now here, of course, there could be eigenvalues inside always. <clears throat> here there is just one unique eigenvalue here, and all the other spectrum is inside. So basically you can r draw a circle which is strictly smaller than unit circle, <laughs> which contains the, all the non-trivial eigenvalues. So then you call the maximal circle Sorry, the minimal, the, the, the gap between the minimal circle, which enclose all the rest of the eigenvalues and the unit circle, you call a gap, spectral gap. And that gives you the rate of decay of correlations. I mean, it gives you a bound on the rate of decay of correlations, right? So that's a gap. So then you can easily show, I leave it as an exercise, but it's almost trivial, that all the correlation functions in this case can be bounded by a constant k times e to the times whatever. Uh, um, I mean, um, let me call this delta. Oh, no, I still prefer to call this delta, but I have to be a little bit careful. So then it's e to the minus delta t. Okay, so there is such delta, which I might call a gap, uh, such that correlation function has exponential decay with exponent delta. I mean, there are some logarithms here which one has to fish out. <clears throat> okay, but then this is the, what mathematicians would call mixing, right? Uh, when they can prove that all correlation functions decay. Now, this is something that people, mathematicians call exponential mixing. And it's the best a form of mixing, right? Um, there are not many systems for which they can prove exponential mixing. There are some maps, uh, like uh, the so-called Arnold cat map, which is a simple classical dynamical system, like a logistic map. For logistic map, by the way, they can also prove exponential mixing uh, <clears throat> uh, at the extreme point, in the chaotic point. Um, Right, and now we have a quantum many-body dynamical system for which we can prove exponential mixing. So that's great, right? Okay, so what is the time? I still have, uh, sorry, sorry. Pre-terminalization. Pre-terminalization is a transient effect. So. Um, it's not really a phase of matter. It's not really a regime of uh, mathematics, right? It's yeah, right. So, and preternal is, um, I mean, it could just well, well be that preternal time crystal or preternal phase of matter is just the mixing, uh, chaotic and mixing. It's just that the time scale can be very long. I mean. Here we cannot distinguish, right? I mean, this is just, this is now really, I mean, that's a problem, right? It, uh, it's a general philosophical problem, right? This many body physics is, uh, many body dynamics is a very hard subject, right? It's very hard to prove anything. And then physicists, you know, like to say a lot about, uh, but in a very vague way, right? So then they invented terms like pre-terminalization, but what, is it, what does it mean in terms of rigorous uh, mathematical physics? I have no idea. I mean, probably it means just that this is, just a long time scale, which is, to, is, is related to some interesting physical mechanisms, which are again really hard to explain sometimes. But you know, here I cannot comment on that. Yeah, I mean, first of all, algebraic decay of correlations are very hard to explain in, in these simple simple terms. I mean, it will not. 
first of all, I mean, the fact that we have reduced the problem to a finite dimension of stochastic matrix means that we cannot explain algebraic decay of correlation full stop, right? Whenever you have algebraic decay of correlations, you need infinite dimensional Markov chains, right? Um, because you have to have a gap, gap closing, uh, but not exactly zero, but closing uh, in some limits and so on. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, so we know right from the start that we would only be able to, to treat exponential. exponential. Okay, now, uh, what's the time? Uh, I have a question. Yeah, please. Can you speak up a bit? I mean. No, no, but remember the individual expectation values are zero. I mean, the, this is already connected correlation function. The product of, I mean, trace of uh, the, the average of A and average of B are zero. Oh, right, because you're taking traceless observables. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so the plateau in correlation function is not a trivial effect. But like for case number one, for example, they're non-interacting, but the correlation is still like non-zero and constant. Yes. So like how, how is that possible if it's a non-interacting system? Well, correlations cannot decay if it's non-interacting, right? And in, the, in, in at time equals zero, correlation is not zero. I mean, it's... Uh, Okay, so it's like a property of like this sort of state that you started with. Yeah. I, I mean, see. Well, I mean, it's an, it's an infinite temperature state, but uh, you are looking at two observables. Um, I mean, it's, it's just, uh, it's, right, uh, and there's some, no, no, it's okay, it's okay. I mean, the point is, yeah, right, I mean, this will be, of course, non-zero, only when the two observables will, will be on the same light ray, right? But since there is no dynamics, it is just the product of, expect, of two observables, right? Trace B dagger A, I mean, it's just overlap between two observables. So if this is like autocorrelation function, it's just trace A square. There's no dynamics, right? So it's like, <clears throat> I mean, this is a free circuit, right? So you place one observable here and the other there. It's just, forget about everything else. This is just uh, this tensor network, right? Which is just this observable contracted with this endpoint. But there's no dynamics in between, so then there's no decay, right? So it's a trivial thing, but you know, it's consistent with what you said. <clears throat> All right, thank you. Okay. How about for traceless A, and B, it's only when it's autocorrelation. Sorry? If A and B are traceless, then it's only non-zero if A equals B. If they are traceless, it's not, no, no. It could be non-zero also for some non-trivial. Uh, well, it depends, yeah. I mean, if you took, uh, if you take A and B as uh, Gelman matri Pauli matrices, right, which are assumed to be uh, Hilbert-Schmidt orthogonal, mm -hmm. yes, then yes, it's true. Yeah. They, are, they are different, there is no correlation, yeah. Sorry, maybe a question about the second case. So here, now ergodic and interacting, does it immediately imply like intergroup systems, like interacting intergroup, or do you also include also other um, mechanism for ergodicity breaking? Uh, uh, no, it is, does not mean intergroup. So non-ergodic non interacting, yeah, this, one, this is what you mean. No, this in general means non integrable as well. I mean, okay. we, have, we, we can cook up examples of that. Uh, for, 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 for dual unitary circuits uh, of qubits, right? I mean, in our paper, we have uh, examples of this uh, parameterization just speci specifying parameters uh, which give either of these, and uh, this is not, in general, integrable. Uh, oh. So it's another mechanism for good city breaking, if you want, yes. Right. Uh, do you know if it's related to any other kind of known mechanism for ergodicity breaking that people talk about these days? I don't know. I don't know. Okay. I would say not, because that's, I mean, 
<coughs> this at least is completely clear, right? I mean, where it comes from. So I don't think it's related to. Uh, yeah, no, I, I wonder whether there is some relations to Hilbert space fragmentation, but it could be possibly, but yeah. I, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, uh, regarding the same regime, uh, so if I understood well, uh, these um, um, basically non-zero and no one uh, eigenvalues give you information on the, early on the early time dynamics. Is this true? Early time, uh, yes. Yeah, well, I mean, oh. yeah. Okay, and so um, what about if uh, all the eigenvalues are e either one or zero? Is that a, si a situation that can happen? Yes, it can. And what, what if all are all either one or zero, yes. Uh, that case situation can happen. Uh, sometimes it does happen. And in which of these uh, um, four groups uh, would you be put them? Because uh, it's the second, the one. second one. Because yes. if there are mo is more than one, which is equal to one, it's uh, non-ergodic, right? No mm -hmm. matter the, the, yeah. the rest okay. is zero. And in this case, um, um, how does it look like? Uh, um, sorry, how does it, it like, um, look like the dynamics at early time? Um, uh, at early time, it can have. Uh, uh, hi, yeah, it's a good point. So, of course, in the in the simplest possible of cases, right, it could be just like this, right? <clears throat> so, if there was no non-trivial Jordan structure, it would be like this, right? But in the examples that I know, there is always, almost always, non-trivial Jordan structure when there is a m macroscopically degenerate eigenvalue zero. It usually comes with non-trivial Jordan blocks, and then you could have some dynamics which extends to times of dimension of the non trivial the largest non trivial, uh, non -trivial jordan blocks uh, cage right thank you i i have a follow up question regarding the second class so if you start from an integrable system whatever the symmetries you have and let's say you have floke many body localization for that you have some sort of not a quasi-local kind of uh, integrals of motions. So uh, the eigenvalues which are non-zero, so that symmetry structure will not reflect in those uh, eigenvalues. I mean, somehow, what is the ergodicity breaking mechanism that is not reflected in the non-zero? Uh, non-zero means eigenvalues which are not equals to one. That structure mm -hmm. will not reflect the symmetries. What is the mechanism of ergodicity breaking? Um, I'm not following you. Uh, so. Uh, so what I'm saying that for the second class, you have a chunk of eigenvalues which are one, and yeah. some are non. Uh, yeah. This non eigenvalue, okay. Uh, these eigenvalues, right? I mean, just since you reminded me, I forgot to say. I mean, these eigenvalues, of course, are related to conserved operators, right? These operators, which I mean, the, the eigen modes, uh, which are which give eigenvalue one, are conserved, right? So if I take, now these are local operators, but if I take translation, this is translation invariant system. Okay. So if I take translation invariant sums on every other side, because this is staggered system. So if I take this, repeat it on every other side, and take a sum, this is exactly conserved. After the full flow case step, it will be exactly translated, it's conserved. So the question is yes. I mean, this would immediately imply that there could be no, uh, well, there could be exact, I mean, there would no, could be no, I mean, there is ergodicity breaking also because there are non-trivial conserved quantities, let's say. which, again, might not necessarily mean integrability. I mean, sometimes it's a trivial uh, symmetry, and sometimes it's uh, something else. <coughs> okay, yeah, th thanks for the questions. Uh, I think I have now like 15 minutes more, right, for until the break, so let me now start with the rest, because we'll need some time to explain the second uh, main thing I wanted to do in these lectures. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, uh -huh, no, before I go there, I mean, let me stress one more thing. I mean, uh, this is not everything, of course, we can tell about dual unitary circuits, uh, about the correlation decay in dual unitary circuits. Uh, I have to stress again that what we assumed here is that uh, observables were ultra-local. Um, now, I can, ex I can relax this assumption, and I can take, let's say, observables with, observables with larger and larger support, like... Um, so, I mean, I just want to quickly comment on one, what would happen if I would consider more complicated observables, right? <coughs> uh, could I still use these quantum channels or should I expand? I mean, the question, uh, <coughs> so now, I mean, what I have now is an observable which is nearly local. Now, imagine I take an observable which has some support R, right? <coughs> so now, what can I do? 
Well, I can do one thing which is totally straightforward. I can take my circuit and I replace, now this is operatorial gate, and I, I can replace one gate with a super gate, which will have support to sides. I mean, this is a philosophy of RG, if you want, but in space time. So I take, instead of, now I take, uh, uh, I consider now this as a, as a, as a box. And now this box has a uh, thick wire, which has dimension d square. Well, d to the fourth, right? Before each wire was a d square, now it's d to the fourth. But my claim is that this big box is also dual unitary. It's easy to show, right? If these little boxes are dual unitary, this tensor product box, which has four uh, pieces, is also dual unitary, which means, and now I can propagate observables of support two with this, right? So I can now define M plus and M minus for observables of support two using this big box. Now we have quantum channel, which has dimension not d square, but d to the four. So a stochastic uh, Markov chain with a matrix dimension d to the four, but everything remains the same. All my classification remains the same. Now, what can happen? What can happen now, the spectrum becomes more rich, so that there could be eigenvalues which go closer to, 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 to unit circle. So there are observables, there could be observables which are less, uh, relaxing and so on. So all this can happen and we, you know, one, it's very hard to investigate this systematically, but you know, we can try at least first few steps. <clears throat> but again, I mean, qualitatively the same remains <clears throat> for any local observable. No, uh, yes, I mean, uh, in general for unitaries, yes, but of course. Yes, of course, of course. This is true for any unitary, but what I'm saying is uh, also dual unitarity survives, yeah? And that's crucial for us to, to make progress in uh, computing correlations. Okay. Okay, so now that's it. That's all I wanted to say about uh, decay of correlations. And now, uh, yeah, maybe before I uh, go to the next chapter, um, let me just comment on what else people could compute uh, using these tricks. Uh, which I will not go into any detail, but uh, there are um, papers by us or by other groups like uh, Peter Clays, Oster Lamacraft, um, <clears throat> uh, Lorenzo Piroli, so on. I mean, where we, people computed uh, 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 entanglement dyna dynamics, uh, operator entanglement, uh, tripartite information. Uh, it's, it turns out that essentially almost anything, right? You can, any dynamical quantity which characterizes correlations or, uh, uh, or quantum correlations or entanglement or, or, uh, or complexity um, or thermalization uh, can be computed within dual, unit, dual, dual unitaries. So that's uh, really OTOX, for example. You know, some people really like OTOX. I don't know why, but uh, <coughs> so. <coughs> So I, I will now conclude my lecture. So I mean, there's a whole lecture, but here, as you will see, it's because this will be kind of hard because to me, this is the most exciting thing you can do about dual unitaries. Personally, I don't know why, but again, probably it has to do with my background. But you know, it's, it's really the, I would say the best proof of, of, of many body chaos in a given interacting dynamics. <clears throat> so, uh, so it has to do with spectral correlations, right? So now we have uh, uh, spectral correlations. Uh, Tions in dual unitary systems or dual unitary circuits. <clears throat> uh, and I will discuss just one object, which is, turns out to be already difficult and interesting enough which is the spectral form factor. So um, I will now spend like, yeah, almost the full lecture plus a few minutes of this lecture discussing spectral form factor. First I will discuss uh, its definition and uh, how it behaves in, in certain uh, limiting cases like uh, free dynamics and random matrix theory. And then I will discuss uh, spectral form factor 
for some special examples of dual unitary circuits. I will not even go to most general. Maybe if the time permits, I will maybe go to the general case in using my slides because otherwise the time will be too short. But I prefer to give you the, the main ideas uh, rather than cover everything. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, I mean, there is this question of what is quantum, quantum anybody chaos? What is quantum chaos, right? I mean, uh, different people understand it differently. Um, there is, and this question has become really uh, one of the central questions also because people from high energy entered here and uh, their ideas are usually quite influential. So uh, then quantum chaos kind of became fashionable. But it's uh, usually, I mean, there uh, in those ideas, people try to uh, understand uh, Lyapunov exponents and uh, this type of uh, definitions uh, of quantum dynamics, which relates to, 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 to Lyapunov exponents. And this usually requires some sort of large parameter, right, which uh, gives you a sort of essentially classical limit. Uh, but the question is really, I mean, if you can define something meaningful, which could uh, be a definition of quantum anybody chaos, which uh, doesn't require any small or large parameter. So it could be defined also for spin one half or uh, qubit uh, circuits. And to that, I think the best, uh, 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 the best uh, definition would be comparing to random matrix theory. I mean, you already yesterday uh, in lectures of Dima Abanin, he mentioned, uh, you know, uh, reference to random matrices in the context of ETH. ETH is basically just a version of random matrix theory, right? Uh, or comparison of random matrix, I mean, the, 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 it's inspired by random, matrix, ma random matrices, right? It's like a, a maximum ignorance. I mean, usually this is related to a principle which is sometimes phrased as maximum ignorance principle in physics, right? I mean, when you know, don't know anything about your problem, then you assume it's structureless. Right, you assume that everything is possible. Everything that could be possible is possible, and then you assume that you do calculation and you compare to your phenomenology, and sometimes it agrees. And that's the best definition of chaos. I mean, that's to me the best definition of chaos, right? If the system does what the random system does, even though it's very structured, then it's chaotic. So now this is the puzzle, right? We have these models which are extremely structured, right? It's co they're composed of Lego bricks, and uh, the only ne neighboring bricks are, are, are touching each other. So the correlation spread in very particular ways. Uh, but as you will see, and as people saw it, uh, a really long time ago, I mean, these problems uh, have spectral correlations which are indistinguishable, indistinguishable from random matrices. So now, how, how can this be? I mean, to me personally, this was a question which inspired me for the last 25 years. I mean, how can this be? This is a really, I think, very important question. Uh, people ask this question, you know, and this is what used to be a field called quantum chaos. People ask this question for simple models like billiards, uh, individual atoms in strong fields, uh, hydrogen atom in magnetic, strong magnetic fields or such a paradigm examples. And uh, they found that these simple models have random matrix spectral statistics. And uh, they explain this. They explain this in terms of semi-classical uh, methods because there was a small parameter there, an effective Planck constant. So there was, I mean, I will briefly touch into the, onto that. Um, but then I will go to trying to explain a little bit about what, I mean, how can uh, random matrix spectral correlations be explained uh, for some examples of, of many body dynamics. And it turns out that dual unitary dynamics is the only, uh, an only class of models for which we can actually accomplish something. And that's, for me personally, the reason why I find, find it so exciting. <clears throat> okay, but now let me just go, with, go slowly. I mean, I introduce spectral form factor. So I will introduce a spectral form factor for flow key dynamics, even though people have studied it for, uh, for uh, arbitrary Hamiltonian dynamics. But for Hamiltonian dynamics, you have additional complications because uh, spectral density of states could be a function of energy. So things could be modulated with energy, so it could be hard. So, I, but since anyway, what we have in mind are Floquet systems, and for Floquet systems, things are easier. There is no preferred energy. There is no ground state. All the energies are kind of democratic, uh, equally important. So there is no, no reason, I, I mean, to expect some modulation of density of states. So let's just say our, we have our many body evolution, and now let's, for some given system size, we can diagonalize this and uh, <coughs> call this, uh, spectrum, quasi-energy spectrum. <clears throat> uh, 
let me call curly n the dimension of the Hilbert space for us is 2 to the L, well, Q to D to the L, sorry, doesn't matter, but it's, uh, we always have a many body system in mind, but what I will say in the next 10, 15 minutes will be completely general, so we'll just use this curly n to denote the number of quasi energy levels. And uh, so then, then what I will now assume is that, you know, you have this uh, spectrum, and you can arrange this spectrum as a set of points on a circle, right? Because this is unitary matrix, spect spectrum is a unit circle, so you can think of this as a gas of particles in a box with periodic boundaries. And this is a very fruitful analogy. I mean, this is something that, you know, was first time advocated by Dyson, uh, sometimes referred to as Dyson gas, uh, to think of eigenvalues of a random matrix as a gas, right? And to write statistical mechanics of this gas. I mean, to study statistical mechanics of a, of a gas. Yeah? And uh, that's what spectral flow factor is about. So it's a, basically a pair correlation function. It's fully a transform of a pair correlation function of this gas of quasi-energy particles. So let me now slowly define it precisely. Okay, so first we define a, de uh, a density, one point function. So now we have a given, so I mean, and then also the, I mean this is statistical physics, right? So now we'll take a given uh, model, but this is a statistical model, so we'll then use an ensemble of models. I mean, we have to argue because we have to do certain averages, right? But now for the moment, this is a given model, so it has a given spectrum. For a given spectrum, you write one point function, which is the density, um, rho phi, which I will define such that it will be correctly normalized. So 2 pi over n, sum over little n, uh, sum over deltas uh, centered at the eigenvalues. So basically, this is a sum of delta spikes. And uh, now I'll define the average. And the average now I will mean the average over the quasi energy. So 1 over 2 pi from 0 to 2 pi rho phi d phi. So now this, this term has n terms. This sum has n terms. So this is n. n over n is canceling. And 2 pi over 2 pi is canceling. So this is 1. So the average, this is normalized such that the average density is 1. Right? And now we define the pair correlation function, two point function. Pair correlation function, the standard object, density density correlation function, the standard object in statistical physics, or I call it R of theta. Also in random matrix theory, people use this R of, the, R of theta. I mean, this is just, as you will see, it's just a Fourier transform of what I will be interested in, but you know, it depends. It's the same object. I mean, it has the same formation. It's just a Fourier transform in between. So R of theta is the two-point function of density density. So we start a density which you displace, you, you center it around phi and you displace it by theta. So you have the sum and the difference coordinates and then you subtract the product of averages. <coughs> and these are equal to one by definition. <coughs> and then you define spectral form factor K of T as a Fourier transform. Uh, now, there are different ways in which you want to normalize it. I prefer to normalize it such as you will see later, it's convenient, but in the literature you find different, also different normalizations, so that's not so crucial. The point is that it's just the Fourier transform of, of the pair correlation function. Now, Fourier, this, is a, this is a Fourier analysis on a circle, right, with periodic boundaries, so the Fourier transform of a function on a circle is a sequence, right? It's an integer sequence. It's not a function because, uh, you know, the time is discrete, right? So now the, 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 the term in the sequence is an integer time, right? <clears throat> it, it's a K of T, right? But T is integer. Okay, so now this is, I think I should probably not do all the calculations to the very end, right? I mean, I invite you to do this exercise. It's uh, really uh, something that is totally straightforward from what we have on the board, right? When you do it carefully, what you find is this is just a product of two terms. One term is e to the i phi n t, and the other term, let's call it n prime, e to the minus i phi n prime t minus n square delta t comma zero. So this is what you get. <coughs> 
I mean, middle is the exercise. <clears throat> okay, so now that's really cool, right? I mean, what is it? This is just sum of phases, right? Which are weighted by T. And this is just trace of U to this U, which I call it curly U, because it's the full many body map to power T. And this is trace of U to minus T. <clears throat> or this guy, co complex conjugate, is the same. And this is some, uh, well, some, some, something which I will not even care about because I will assume my time is non-zero, it's positive, so it doesn't matter. So when time is zero, of course, um, this guy is n, this guy is n, so everything blows up, right? But I, the way I defined it, uh, it should be zero at time zero, so it should cancel, right? <clears throat> but now I will just define spectral form factor and I will assume that t is not equal to zero. It's just trace of u to the t model square. I leave some space here. I have to comment on this. <clears throat> okay, so now, uh, that's kind of nice, right? I mean, uh, <coughs> you have a Fourier transform of a, uh, of a spectral correlation function. So it, 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 this knows about correlations between levels, right? I mean, either on small or large distances. I mean, it's a, it has all the correlations, all the pair two-point correlations among levels. And this is a Fourier transform, so it also has all the correlations. But short quasi-energy correlations are hidden now in long times and vice versa. I mean, uh, Short times uh, encode correlations across, uh, let's say, short time mean 2 pi uh, energy distance, quasi energy distance. So, shortest possible time mean correlations between quasi energies which are in the opposite sides of unit circle. But anyway, I mean, this encodes all the correlations. The problem is that this object is not well defined unless one does not do an additional averaging. And this averaging means you have to average over some ensemble of systems or over some parameter with which you can sample the spectrum and so on and so forth. I mean, the reason why you have to do it is that this object itself is not what mathem mathematicians would call, or people who work in random matrices would call self-averaging. Self-averaging means that uh, if you don't, that this object basically uh, has fluctuation which is of the order of its, of its value, of its mean. So the expected fluctuation of this object, because it's a statistical object, the expected fluctuation is of the same order as its value. So if you just calculate this for a given dynamics, then you will find a plot like this, right? And it's uh, rubbish, right? You can't make use of it. Now you can do two things. You can do moving time average, right? And then you get something out. Or you can do really for analytical work, the most honest averaging is to introduce some disorder, even very tiny one, and then you average over this disorder, and then you get a smooth curve. And this curve then can be compared to whatever model you want to compare to, and uh, usually we'll compare to random matrices. So I think, well, now it's a good time to stop. I, I'm already running over time, but maybe we can now take a break and continue after. So any question so far from this? <clears throat> No, 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 no. This is completely general. This is completely general. I'm just uh, throwing the definition which is, has been around for decades. And uh, Of course, there are lots of uh, measures of spectral correlations in textbooks on random matrices, like meta is a big collection of all possible k-point functions that people can compute. And I will not go into that. If you want to show that some model has a random matrix spectral correlations, you have to show that all k-point functions agree with random matrices. That's usually very hard, but this is the simplest measure which is the easiest to work with and already quite non-trivial. <clears throat> All right, then let's <clears throat> uh, meet at 11.05 and uh, thank uh, Tomas for this first lecture. Thank you.